What is up, you guys? Welcome back to Twink Revolution. I'm Sam. And I'm Gian. And we are joined by very special guest, returning guest, author, journalist, and general political rabble rouser, <laughs> Caleb Maupin. <laughs> Caleb, hi, welcome back. Sure, I'm glad to be back. So Caleb has written a new book uh, that has just come out um, called Kamala Harris and the Future of America. And um, we, we were blessed enough to uh, get a little advanced sneak peek. Um, and so, yeah, we've read it and, and really enjoyed it. Um, kind of wanted to ask you a little bit about the, the context of writing this book, because it's not, um, it's not a political biography and it's not even a political hit piece. Um, you know, but but clearly uh, Kamala Harris is somebody who's likely to be our next president. <laughs> her um, her her genesis and her her temperament, her character is of issue. But I loved um, and I hate to quote yourself back at you, but but there's just a wonderfully pithy statement. Um, which I think you say Kamala Harris is the logical conclusion of a long process of distorting leftist politics and reducing it to a crude Freudian manipulation. Um, so. You know, what can people expect in the book? What is what is the structure of it? Well, I thought that the book had to be written uh, because, you know, when I first heard about Kamala Harris, right, I mean, she was a senator from California. That's when I first encountered her on the national scene. Uh, she seemed just like any other Democratic politician. But then I was informed um, by someone who I probably should not name, uh, but someone who is a, a prominent Marxist scholar, uh, that her father was a well-known Marxist as well. Um, and when I came across that information, I was quite surprised. Um, and from there, I began to look into Kamala Harris' record as a criminal prosecutor. And that was pretty shocking to me because she was definitely not a progressive. She was definitely not a, a friend of the downtrodden as much as her autobiography, uh, The Truths We Hold, tries to present that. And the more you look into her life story, the more you look into her father, the more you look into her upbringing, uh, you read her autobiography and read what she wrote and also what she's put in between the lines, you can see that she is very much a culmination of a very, very long process of changing what it means to be a socialist, what it means to be a leftist and a revolutionary in the United States. And the fact that, that the progressive movement could produce someone like Kamala Harris the fact that uh, that that we're in a period where where revolution and the unleashing of chaos uh, is is one of the primary means by which the ruling class and the big bankers and corporations rule the world. Um, that all forced me to really do a lot of investigation. The book is an essay in three parts. And, and I make clear at the beginning of the book, I'm not trying to make the case that Kamala is more dangerous than Trump, that you should you know not vote for not vote for Biden because she's more, da I'm not saying that. And I'm quite critical of Trump towards the end of the book. I talk about Trump's very, very, very dangerous side as well. But the book is using Kamala Harris, her life story, and a lot of the research I did to make some overall points about where we are as a country. Um, it's in three parts. Uh, the first part, I talk about, um, you know, the history of leftist politics and how Kamala Harris grew up in this activist milieu. I mean, she went, her parents met at demonstrations, right? They met at civil rights marches in Berkeley. Uh, the second part, I talk about the psychology and, you know, how Kamala doesn't really like to talk about her father very much. And the more you look into the relationship with the father, the more you can learn. But also that leads us to what is it that really drives people to be revolutionaries and leftists. And I, I draw from Sigmund Freud and civilization and its discontents. And in the final piece, I come to a thesis about the Hillary Clinton State Department and the role that they played, how the Obama administration tried to restrain them, how Tulsi Gabbard represents forces within the Pentagon that tried to restrain them, and really what's going on behind the scenes, because there is a big fight among our ruling class right now and, and where we go from there. I tried to follow the tradition of, of Marxist scholars. Um, you know, if you read the writings of Lenin, uh, you read the, the, the writings of, of, you know, Kautsky, for example. You, you read the writings of great Marxists. They analyze things with depth, right? This wasn't a pamphlet. This wasn't just a hit piece, right? But it wasn't also certainly wasn't speaking of her in a positive light either. I was trying to speak to those of us who are revolutionaries, those of us who are socialists, those of us who want to get to a new society where profits are not in command. What does Kamala Harris stand for and where is the United States going? What is happening? Uh, that, that our movement could produce someone like her. Uh, what's going on here? 
that was the point of the book. And uh, I'm glad you liked it. Yeah, well, I mean, it's it's interesting you sort of mentioned the um the the sort of the mark the Marxist mode of communication. It's because it it is it is a style that you don't read often. And I, I've got to say, it's um you know you said it's not a pamphlet, and I, I think it's it's definitely not. It's a substantial uh, a substantial work. Um, but but it is a style that honestly we've lost on the left outside of very limited pamphleteering because it has that it's it follows a thread, um, and it pulls on the thread and and um. You know, I, I'm sure you don't mind me saying. I mean, it's 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 far ranging. It is bringing in some some concepts that at first feel uh, unrelated, or you're like, oh, gee, where, where's he going with this? And then you pull the thread back together, and you see, yes, there, there's a there's a narrative here which really does require that depth to to untangle. Indeed, yes. I mean, I mean, there's a this is how Marxists train people to think, right? I mean, one of the greatest books in the Marxist tradition, I think, uh, that is that is the point of reference. Uh, if you want to understand uh, the history of Christianity is The Foundations of Christianity by Karl Kautsky, right? And in that book, he doesn't just say Christianity is wrong. He doesn't just, you know, I mean, he goes into great detail. He talks about, you know, Israel and the history of, of ancient Israel and Palestine. He talks about the Roman Empire and the structure of the Roman Empire. He talks about the rise of medieval Europe and the rise of feudalism. Uh, he talks about, I mean, he talks about so many topics to get you to understand where Christianity came from, uh, where it where it led to, the role it played, and and all the way up until and to his contemporary times. I believe the book came out in the 1800s, but that is how Marxists generally think, right? Is like. What, what, where did this come from? What role does it play? What forces are at work? And yeah, in the book, I end up talking about Libya. I talk about Syria. Uh, I talk about Stalin. Uh, I talk about the five-year economic plans. I talk about the Black Panthers. I talk about uh, the Congress for Cultural Fr Freedom Program of the CIA. I talk about a, a film that Disney put out, a cartoon during the 1940s, demonizing Nazi Germany and how that's similar to some of the themes that we see in Trump's rhetoric. Um, I talk about Huey Long from Louisiana. I talk about a lot of different things, all trying to get you to understand who is Kamala Harris. I think there is a very, very, very good chance. I would say almost a 75% chance that Kamala Harris will be president at some point in her lifetime. If it doesn't happen, I will be shocked. And that's why I figured, you know, I had been planning to write this book if she got the vice presidential nomination. And I, I received word from a number of people that it was very, very likely she would be the vice presidential nominee. Um, and, you know, I mean, I have all kinds of people. When you're a journalist, you have to talk to people from all sides of the political spectrum, from all sides, from all kinds of different countries. You know, we're all just trying to get little bits of information, figure out what's going on, put things together, tie it all together and present it to the world. Right. That's what you do as a journalist. And so I have a lot of different people I talk to. I have a lot of different sources and all of that of people passing information along to me. And, and I became aware that, that it was very likely Kamala Harris would be a candidate, but I also became aware that there are a lot of people within the power structure who are very afraid of her because they see her as a continuation of the Hillary Clinton State Department. Um, and I became aware of a lot of what went on in the background, uh, you know, with Ben Rhodes and the Obama administration. And, and, and there's a lot there. There's a lot in this book to understand who Kamala Harris really is and why she represents a very, very, very dangerous wing of the ruling class. You know, doing the research for this book, I almost got a new respect for Joe Biden, actually, <laughs> right? As much as I, I don't intend to vote for him, you know, I mean, he and Obama, you know, they wanted to do the Iran deal. They wanted to have diplomatic relations with Cuba. John Kerry, uh, Barack Obama, Joe Biden, they're closer to like regular liberals, right? I mean, that's kind of what they are, right? They're more about Let's win without war. Let's have soft power. You know what I mean? Yep. But the Hillary Clinton State Department, Samantha Power, Cass Sunstein, Jared Andrew Cohen, uh, Anne-Marie Slaughter. I mean, these forces represent something very, very dangerous. The name, the name sure Slaughter is um, too, too poetic, isn't it, really, given the, the outcome of that State Department? Indeed. Anne-Marie Slaughter wrote an essay that was published by the Council on Foreign Relations uh, right after Trump won the elections. They had a special issue of foreign affairs called The Power of Populism. And on the front cover, they had the American Gothic, right? And if you read that, that issue, that is probably, you know, every essay in that issue of foreign affairs really gives you an understanding of the anti-Trump wing of the ruling class and what they think. And the lead essay was written by Anne-Marie Slaughter, who was just the rock star of Hillary Clinton's State Department. You read that essay, it is about we are going to foment unrest 
and chaos and revolution all around the world to tear down quote unquote populist governments to make way for an open international system, uh, which means open trade, open information. And I, I read that, and as somebody who is familiar with, with how the World Trade Organization and the IMF and the World Bank operate, and how our living standards here in the United States have been going down, how Mexico has suffered under NAFTA, how so many countries have just been reduced to utter poverty, I, I saw what that was really about. And I looked at Libya and I looked at Syria and we know we know what they mean. And why is populism the target rather than socialism or communism or or you know, you know, I mean this is this is far different than the Cold War. This isn't an ideological war. This is about maintaining the rule of big multinational corporations and staging unlimited chaos and unrest in order to carry it out. And it's it's very frightening stuff. But I'm sure you've got more questions. <laughs> so we hear a lot about Donald Harris, who's this column. Com- Kamala's um, father, because he was an alleged Marxist. Um, and everyone, I think for us, like, I'm shocked, like, how she became a horrible prosecutor, mass incarcerating, like, parents and cannabis users and... A horrible history with uh, transgender people yeah. in prison. Yeah. Um, could you go on and explain, like, is her father actually a Marxist? And, like, what role did he play? And how did he go... How did she go from being his child to, like, being this horrible corporatist candidate. <laughs> her father is from Jamaica. Um, and uh, her mother, uh, Shmaila Gopalan, uh, is from India, right? Uh, her mother was a cancer researcher from India. Uh, her father was a Jamaican. Uh, I mean, he is a Jamaican. He lives in Jamaica. At this point, he's retired. Uh, but he taught at Stanford University for many years. And he's an economist. He's an academic economist. And he draws heavily from Marx uh, in his writing. Um, he talks about unemployment uh, statistics, drawing from Marx's theory of overproduction, uh, the general law of capitalist accumulation, uh, the falling rate of profit. He has a Marxist understanding of economics. And he very much was seen, you know, in the 1970s is really when he came to prominence. And, and that's when his career really took off. And he was, in the 1970s, there was a big pushback against neoclassical economics, right? And just free markets are always the answer and all of that. There was kind of a pushback in the early 70s. Um, and he was an advisor to many Jamaican prime ministers. Um, and he, you know, he translates economic data. Um, and that, that's who he is. I mean, to call him a communist is a huge exaggeration, right? I mean, I, I, I've never read anything about him leading protests and demonstrations. He's not out in the woods with, with a rifle like Che Guevara. Um, and I mean, Jamaica has never been an anti-imperialist state. There have been a number of of social democratic governments there. Um, I, and I think that he's somebody who would be associated more with uh, the, the Manly government, right? And there was a leader, uh, uh, Manly, uh, who talked about democratic socialism. There was even some reggae songs uh, to promote this. It was kind of a Bernie Sanders government in Jamaica for a while. Uh, there's a song, um, Socialism is Love, uh, by, 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 a, by a popular Jamaican reggae promoter that you know, socialism is love for your brother, you know, you know, poverty and hunger is what we're fighting. It was kind of a, you know, I mean, he's a liberal, he's a liberal social democratic economist. And he mainly, he's not a, a, a campaigner. He's advising whoever is elected, giving them economic data and trying to, trying to set economic policy in Jamaica to be more effective, right? Um, at the same time, Jamaica is a very capitalist country. The other thing is that he taught economics for many years at Stanford University. Um, and now he's, you know, he's retired. He's Professor Emer- Emeritus, as they say. Um, but, uh, but the thing is that he basically became estranged from Kamala when she was eight years old. There was a divorce proceeding that went down. And in her autobiography, Kamala Harris says that the only thing her parents fought over was the books. Um, but if you read statements from Donald Harris, it's pretty clear they didn't just fight over the books. They fought over Kamala and her younger sister. Um, and he describes how he was basically deprived of the ability to see her after she was eight years old. And he blames it on racist uh, court proceedings in Oakland, California. Um, he says that they assumed that because he was, even though he was a highly educated academic, because he was a man of color uh, from the Caribbean, they assumed that he wouldn't be a good father um, and he, he lost uh, his ability to see her. Kamala does not care for Donald very much and Donald does not care for Kamala very much. Um, uh, Kamala was asked on a radio interview if she'd ever smoked marijuana. That's the statement where she famously admitted it. Um, but in her, her admitting it, which is scandalous in and of itself because she's jailed so many people for smoking marijuana, one of the statements that she made was, 
half my family's from Jamaica. What do you think? Um, and the crazy thing about that is her father really took offense to that statement so much that he went public and denounced her and he dissociated himself from her campaign, uh, saying that, uh, saying that her campaign was, uh, was, was using identity politics and he denounced her. And then he wrote this essay, which is very, very, I mean, it almost, you know, moved me emotionally. If you read this essay that he wrote, Reflections of a Jamaican Father, where he talks about his, his, his grandmother, uh, his maternal and paternal grandmothers, and how they educated him about politics. He talked about taking J uh, young Kamala to, uh, to Jamaica, to his, the places where he grew up as a child, and taking her around. He describes her as, as always the bold and assertive one, uh, running ahead. Uh, you know, uh, I mean, it's, it's quite a poetic essay, but it also hints at the fact that the amount of uh, tension between them is not small. Now, Kamala, you know, on social media, she will tweet out images of her mother. She talks about her mother as a hero. She did that in her speech at the Democratic National Convention. But uh, her father, well, he was there. Here's a picture of us together one time. That's, that's about it. Um, and uh, it, it seems pretty clear there's a lot of, a lot of underlying tension there. And that, that her hatred for her father seems to m have motivated a lot of what Kamala did because her father is a dark-skinned African man, right? I mean, I mean, and I mean, he's Jamaican origin. And a lot of what she did was lock up dark-skinned African-American men. I mean, that was, that was what she did for decades. I mean, that was what she was. When she was rising in her career as a prosecutor in the 1990s, uh, that was a period when mass incarceration in California was skyrocketing. I mean, she was very much uh, involved with that. And uh, I mean, there's the famous clip where she laughs about jailing the parents of children who are truant from school um, and brags about it and then brings in her own history. I would be nowhere without my education as if it has something to do with her, which it, it's, it's there's a lot there, folks. I mean, I lay it all out there in the book, very carefully researched. So there you yeah, go. Yeah, no, no, I, did, uh, I particularly enjoyed that section because um, it was there was a lot of history I didn't know there. I, I have Donald Harris's quote here, and I, I think I, I might just reproduce it because it's just one of the most scorching things ever said of, of a candidate. Um, my dear departed grandmothers, as well as my deceased parents, must be turning their grave right now to see their family's name, reputation, and proud Jamaican identity being connected in any way, jokingly or not, with a fraudulent stereotype of a pot-smoking joy seeker and the pursuit of identity politics. Speaking for myself and my immediate Jamaican family, we wish to categorically dissociate ourselves from this travesty. I mean, yeah. holy shit, imagine your dad, you're running for office, running for president, your dad's rolling that, I mean, ugh. Yeah, now he's not giving any interviews, uh, and at least until after the election at this point. So that, that's the last public statement that we've had from him. Uh, but uh, you read this essay that he wrote. Uh, it's about 10 pages, uh, Reflections of a Jamaican Father. It, it, kind of, um, it kind of reeks of just, just bitterness, but sadness. It's a very bittersweet piece. Um, and you get an image of, of the, the loss, kind of the tragedy, the, the sadness that he felt about being deprived of the ability to be part of his daughter's lives, being deprived of the ability to have his daughters really understand Jamaica and its heritage. Uh, he talks about how um, uh, how his maternal grandmother uh, was very proud to be a laborite and associated with uh, the Labor Party of Jamaica and and the history there. He talks about the labor theory of value. Uh, it's really fascinating. It's very very fascinating. The New York Times hinted at a little bit of this when Kamala was selected. They 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 gave a couple paragraphs to Donald Harris, but there's a lot more there. There's a lot more there. I mean, and it, it might be worth. Um, I, I know you kind of touched on this, but uh, just just for the benefit of our listeners, I mean, the, the difference between sort of um, the Marxist critique of capitalism that all capitalist economists use freely um, and, and being a, a Marxist as a, as a mode of, you know, having a theory of change and revolution, right? I mean, it's, and, and as far as we can tell, Donald Harris is really the former. I mean, he's, a, he's, a, he's an economist. Yeah, I mean, he would, he would fit in well at the Institute for Policy Studies or you know, uh, you know, I mean, at the at the uh, the economics department of Yale University or something. Um, I, I've never seen anything where he advocates a revolution or, right. or, or it's, you know, out. In the, I mean, apparently he did meet uh, Kamala's mother during the protests uh, at Berkeley. And that's what's particularly interesting because Berkeley, California, was really the center of the new left. I mean, that was, you know, the year that Kamala was born, 1964. 
that was the year of the free speech movement at UC Berkeley, right? That's, that's when the, the students were told they couldn't organize around off-campus issues. So they went out and, and did it anyway. And there's a, there was a, you know, a student who'd set up a civil rights literature table, was arrested. So the students surrounded the police car and set up a, a microphone on top of the police car and held the police car for like you know, a, a day or two as kind of a symbol of free speech. Uh, there's Mario Savio, who was the student leader there, giving that famous quote, there comes a time when the operation of the machine becomes so odious that you can't even passively take part. You've got to throw yourself upon the gears and upon the wheels and say that unless you're free, the machine cannot function at all. Uh, you know, Berkeley, I mean, this was, this was the Black Panther Party was in Oakland when it started, but their fundraising was on the Berkeley campus. They would sell Mao's Little Red Book on the Berkeley campus. Uh, Bob Avakian, the leader of the Revolutionary Communist Party, was uh, actually the son, wild as it sounds, the son of a local judge in Berkeley, right? Uh, one of the most prominent judges in Berkeley, who actually was on the California State Supreme Court for a while, uh, Spurgeon Avakian. Well, it was his son, uh, Bob Avakian, who got involved in the protests at Berkeley, now leads the Revolutionary Communist Party. Uh, for a long time, we had the International Socialist Organization, the ISO in the United States. Well, the ISO originated as the Berkeley chapter of the Independent Socialist uh, League, the ISL, or the, the Independent Socialist Club of Berkeley, right? And when Max Schachtman, uh, who was their leader, uh, when he officially dropped any support for Leninism, uh, they aligned themselves with Tony Cliff rather than Max Schachtman. Um, and then that's, you know, that's the ISO. And like all over the world, people know the IS tendency, right? I mean, I'm sure any corner of the world, you're going to see the IS. It's, it's probably the biggest current of Trotskyism. Uh, you know, it comes out of Berkeley as well. Um, and Ramparts Magazine, uh, that was, you know, I mean, that, that magazine, they made Eldridge Cleaver famous. And the editor was none other than David Horowitz, uh, who is now the, the big neocon and, and right-wing conservative. He was the editor of this far-left magazine called Ramparts that was all over Berkeley. Berkeley was the center of left-wing activism in, in, the 19, in the 1960s and 70s, but it was also ground zero for a lot of CIA insanity, um, like Project MK Ultra, which was a drug program where the CIA was going around distributing drugs to people all over the colleges and, and all kinds of places. In Berkeley, they had a particular project uh, where they would have prostitutes, uh, you know, lure clients, uh, you know, lure men back to a house they would then tie them to the bed and give them LSD to see how they reacted. Uh, they would also have people dressed like, the CIA would have people dressed like hippies walking around the street and they would just give people pills. Hey, try this brother, check it out. Uh, they, would, they would have people randomly drop LSD into people's drinks in restaurants, right? And uh, it was a crazy project where the CIA was going around Berkeley, going around the Bay Area, getting people, you know, getting people high on LSD just to see what might happen. Right. Totally unethical. And, and, and nothing has changed. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it's funny. It's funny, actually, uh, just, you know, given yeah, Kamala's sort of Berkeley ties and then Donald Harris ends up uh, at Stanford. I, I love the idea that sort of the, his the history of this beef is not all this family history, which you've researched so carefully, but actually just a a local sporting rivalry, um, sort of Stanford versus Berkeley, uh, famously, I think. So, you know, there's an alternate theory for you. <laughs> um, it, it, in other rivalries, I mean, more, more serious rivalries or uh, more existential threat rivalries, I mean, you, you outline the contours of a split in the ruling class, of which you sort of mention, um, you, you, sorry, you, you mentioned, um, you know, Kamala represents a threat to one part of this split, and is the sort of the poster child of the other. Could you talk a little bit more about the, the contours of that split and who are these people? Well, there is, there is a longstanding division in U.S. politics between the rich and the ultra-rich. Um, and that this has really defined U.S. political discourse, you know, since the end of the Second World War, but even before that, right? I mean, Roosevelt very much represented the Rockefellers and a lot of wealthy New England folks who saw that, uh, that capitalism was in a crisis and said, okay, Let's have stability, and we're willing to accept organized labor. We're willing to enact progressive reforms, align with the Soviet Union against the Nazis, because they wanted stability rather than than you know chaos in the streets, revolution, fascism, whatnot. And Roosevelt's biggest enemies were the National Association of Manufacturers, the factory owners, uh, Henry Ford, Henry Morgan, and they saw that the response to the, the crisis of capitalism in their minds was they wanted fascism. I mean, they attempted a military coup, the famous business plot to overthrow Roosevelt. And it seemed like the richest of the rich were for Roosevelt's progressive reforms because it was a way to stabilize society. 
and the lower levels of capital, the factory owners, wanted uh, some kind of fascist militarist movement to just crush any progressive movement. And Roosevelt won out. Uh, Hitler was defeated in the Second World War. But that, that divide in the ruling class remained intact. And after the Second World War was over, and after the Roosevelt wing of the Democratic Party was, was kind of purged during the McCarthy period, um, you had kind of an insurgency among those lower levels of capital, where they were just, they were accusing the Rockefeller family of being communists, they were accusing the U.S. Army of being communists, and McCarthyism, it started out, yes, as just kind of a purge of U.S. society, we're not going to have any communist influence, but pretty soon it got way out of control, and it was these lower level capitalists, these small business owners, the, the kind of folks that went on to form the John Birch Society and such, that were going crazy. And they were making it impossible for the USA to negotiate with the USSR, to make geopolitical allies. Like Yugoslavia cut relations with the USSR in 1948, right? And so it was a, a communist country that was anti-Soviet. So of course, the United States wanted to be friendly to Yugoslavia. But you couldn't do that in the context of McCarthyism, because, oh my gosh, it's a communist, we can't, have it. you know, and, and so it was, it was very much McCarthyism kind of went crazy and made it very difficult. So you have the origins of the new left were were the, you know, the Rockefellers, you know, wealthy folks, the Eastern establishment, you know, trying to push back against McCarthyism. And th there was also a fear that, that if the United States entered a crisis, if you create a situation where U.S. society is all about hating communists, when there's a crisis, people are going to become communists, right? So you want to you create kind of a buffer where it's like, okay, well, we're, we're, we have different views here. So the new left, what you can call the new left, what Kamala grew up in, was an attempt by one section of the ruling class, namely the CIA, um, a lot of the big foundations, the Ford Foundation and others, to try and push back against McCarthyism. But then, let's remember what happened. That got out of control as well, right? <laughs> Students for a Democratic Society that started out as, as kind of an anti-communist civil rights group ended up, by 1968, being led by different factions that supported the Black Panthers and supported the, the, the Vietnamese National Liberation Front and were waving Mao's Red Book around. And, and so Nixon was very much a response to the response getting out of control, right? And that, that if you can understand all of this, you had the rise of neoconservatism and what I call the late Cold War normal, because that's really, that's the America that I grew up in. And it's post-1974, post you had this normal in U.S. society where you had this core of people that were evangelical conservative, evangelical Christians, you know, big supporters of the military. They were kind of the core of U.S. society. And liberals were basically a milder version of what they, they believed the same kind of things. They were just kind of watered down. <laughs> right. And, and as the 1970s, 60s political upsurge, you know, went further and further down the memory hole. We moved further to the right as a country with this core of neoconservative uh, geopolitics and evangelical Christian fanatics that kind of ran the military and ran the state apparatus. And, you know, but then in the Bush years, we see the global situation once again slipping out of their hands with Russia and China getting stronger, uh, with, with the rise of Bolivarianism in Latin America, uh, with a huge, huge amount of unrest and discontent in the African-American community. Um, and so we see an attempt by one of these same forces to try and push back against neoconservatism. We see the rise of Barack Obama, and that obviously doesn't solve all of our problems. We now have the situation with Trump. And this is a long trajectory. And I put that at the end of the first chapter because it's important to understand. Kamala Harris fits into a long trajectory of U.S. politics that leads us right up to where we are, where there are factions in the ruling class that are fighting against each other. Donald Trump, he is with Betsy DeVos. Uh, the Secretary of Education, uh, who's a billionaire. Her brother's Eric Prince of Blackwater. He is with Bernie Marcus, uh, the owner of Home Depot. Uh, he is with Sheldon Adelson, the real estate tycoon of Nevada. Uh, I mean, he is with Hobby Lobby, the uh, the, the the you know the chain of of crafts and and stores that was 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 available and was very conservative. He's with one section. He's with Likud in Israel and Netanyahu. Uh, uh, he's with uh, the anti-Iran lobby in Los Angeles and the, the shot. He's, he's with the Miami Cubans. He's got a constituency. There is a much more powerful constituency um, that, that is thinking long term and strategically. That constituency is made up of the four super major oil companies. That constituency includes the, the tech giants of Silicon Valley, Google, Facebook. And those folks see Donald Trump as a threat because he's not on board with their long term geopolitical strategy for dominating the world economy. They just want to make profits in the short term. 
Um, and, and that's really the divide in the ruling class. And Kamala has become the poster child for that more powerful faction, what you might call the Eastern establishment, the Silicon Valley fascists, uh, you know, the big oil monopolists uh, that, that, that basically see, that see Donald Trump as an impediment to their agenda of, of dominating the world. Yeah, the sponsor is a twink revolution for anybody <laughs> following along at home. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Yeah, you kind of touch on the book as well, like how many elements of like the left and intelligentsia, like Alfred Kinsey and like Margaret Sainer were all funded by like, groups like Rockefeller and stuff. And I think for a lot of people that might be surprising, but why do you think, or what advantage does the capitalist class have in financing these people who seem they, like they don't actually intercept the politics at all like they research sex and like reproductive Culture care and- yeah well I, margaret sanger started out as a communist right i mean she was in new york city uh she was on the committee of the socialist party she was a, a donor to the industrial workers of the world um she's wealthy um and you know she very much believed in women's rights she had uh the the rebel woman was her magazine that was published and and she was a communist she was a marxist um and she believed in birth control and women's rights. She was always being arrested for sending birth control through the mail. Um, and she saw the Marxist movement as very much a vehicle for liberating women. And I think throughout her whole career, she believed in birth control because she wanted to give women reproductive choice. She was a feminist. She believed in women's rights. That's what she was about. Um, however, uh, you know, she fled the United States uh, and, you know, after threatening the life of John D. Rockefeller, which is a whole w- wild story. <laughs> She fled the United States. She was facing all kinds of criminal charges over birth control and such. And, you know, she lived in Britain. And in Britain, she started talking with the Neo-Malthusian Society. And the Neo-Malthusians, there's a long tradition of this in Britain, of thinking there are too many people in the world and that economic problems are rooted in overpopulation. Um, And she started hanging out with them. She also visited the Soviet Union and didn't like it. Uh, You know, she was into socialism because she thought it would lead to a free sex free love, uh, gender-liberated society. She got to the Soviet Union and she saw that that was not the case. The traditional family was very much intact. In, in, in in, in uh, it was a very militarized, conservative society that was fighting for its life against Western capitalism. It had a state-centrally planned economy, but it was not, uh, it was not the free love sex paradise that she wanted. Um, so she was disillusioned with the Soviet Union. So she went back to Britain. She was hanging out with the Neo-Malthusians. And eventually, John D. Rockefeller, who she threatened, let's not recall, she threatened his life, and that's why she fled the country, ended up, you know, paying her. She ended up going back to New York City and starting the first abortion uh, clinic and the first, you know, reproductive rights birth control clinic. She started the Birth Control League, which is now known as, uh, it's known officially as, as Planned Parenthood. It was originally called the Birth Control League. She started it. And She dropped Marxist economics for Malthusian economics, and that became very clear. She believed overpopulation was the problem. During the 1930s, there was a Great Depression, and she argued that the Great Depression was caused by the poor people having too many babies. Um, There's a famous poster that she used to raise money, and it had a little orphan girl holding a bowl on it, And, uh, and, and it said the cruelty of charity. Now, you would look at that poster and you'd think, give the poor little girl food. But in her mind, uh, the poor little girl should never have been created to begin with, right? And and the the phrase cruelty of charity, right? If you feed poor people, then they breed. You know what I mean? This This is really maniacal British Empire thinking. And, you know, she spoke at Ku Klux Klan meetings. That's documented. Um, she wrote and talked about uh, the hope for, for and in her mind, uh, breeding out in what she deemed to be inferior races, uh, arguing that, that through eugenics and through birth control, they could gradually eliminate African Americans. Uh, you know, she believed in women's rights. She believed in the right to birth control. But she was getting money from the Rockefellers, and she was getting money from the Malthusians, and she threw in with a really nasty bunch of people. And for a long time, Planned Parenthood would, would just kind of pretend this didn't exist. They finally, finally, like like we're talking like a month ago, <laughs> finally Planned Parenthood has, has, has disavowed her, right? Wow. It's taken them this long. They finally have disavowed her. But some really nasty letters have surfaced where, I mean, she says things like, uh, like we shouldn't, you know, we shouldn't let them know our goal is to eliminate black people. But that's, I mean, it was, just, it's really intense. I mean, the level of, of racism of the crowd she was hanging out with was, was very intense. Um, that's Margaret Sanger. Um, you know, and, you know, the Kinsey report, similar story, right? I mean, now Alfred Kinsey, I, I think he very much did believe in sexual freedom. Um, but to do his research, I mean, he had no qualms, uh, you know, using uh, the, the research and the investigative work of some pedophiles, right? And that's been 
pretty well documented uh, that there were some child molesters uh, who he who he got information about, you know, how you know, uh, pre- prepubescent children's bodies works and such. Um, and you can look into the details. It's pretty gross. I don't want to repeat it here. Yeah. But um, but but I mean, Alfred Kinsey did some pretty unethical stuff as well. Um, but I think that the Rockefellers, again, their feeling was, you know, the way that we're going to defeat communism, the way we're going to um, the way that we're going to roll back the influence of the Soviet Union, of Russia and China is by creating kind of a global wave of instability, right? The, the far right wing, the McCarthyists, the neocons are saying, let's militarize our society. Let's lock down. Let's, let's just, you know, and the Rockefellers are saying, let's create a wave of global instability, chaos and unrest. Let's unleash everyone's impulses. Let, let's give people, give people a level of freedom that will make it so no stable force of opposition to our capitalist power uh, can, can exist. And that strategy is the strategy. The Rockefellers, that is the strategy of the Hillary Clinton State Department. We've seen the results of it in Libya. We've seen the results of it in Syria. It's not good. We've seen the results of it in Honduras. It's not good. So um, you, you, you kind of mentioned, I mean, um, yeah, I, I love uh, the end of the first chapter, uh, for, I think it's the first chapter, uh, where you give a sketch of the sort of the progression through um, uh, sort of McCarthyism and, and those steps. Um, just to pander to our audience, I mean, you do mention sort of one of the excesses of uh, McCarthyism was the focus on LGBT people, um, and particularly, you know, the 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 idea of sort of the, the made made one prone to um, you know communist infiltration um, if you played your cards yes. right, I, I suppose. Um, <laughs> yeah, the State Department. Oh, I'm finished your question. I'm sorry. No, no, sorry. That, that, that was. I mean, that was kind of the thought. It was only only if you could say a little more on on. It, in this history you, you you've kind of um prepared i mean it's it's a there there's a few appearances of maybe i mean the the next big appearance right would be the bush era of the sort of the the fusion of the, the um or sorry actually earlier it's the, it's the christian uh the, the sort of moral majority evangelicals and then again in the bush era you know obviously 2004 election was basically sort of the, the culture war issue they picked was was gay marriage and things like that. So I was wondering if you, if you could sort of pull on that thread for us, even though I know it's not the central topic of the book, except to say Kamala's uh, record on, on trans people is really shitty. <laughs> well, um, I mean, the thing with, with McCarthy period was during the McCarthy period, they actually made a ban that no homosexual could work for the U.S. State Department. The idea was that if you were gay, uh, that, that the, uh, the Soviet Union could blackmail you with it or something. And that gay people were known to be, you know, radicals or, or whatnot. Um, and that there's actually a clip where Joe McCarthy makes a very homophobic joke on the floor of the U.S. Congress. Um, have, you, have you ever seen this clip where he says uh, he's asked, uh, uh, you know, he makes reference to so and so being a quote unquote pixie. Um, and then and then somebody asks Joe McCarthy, they say, well, what is a pixie? And he says, well, it's a close relative of the fairy. And the yes, room starts yeah. laughing. I'm going to start using that as an insult on Twitter now. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but the other thing that's that's rather weird is that many people speculate that Joe McCarthy was himself uh, gay. Yeah, uh, that, that's relatively well documented at this point, I think, or at least well, well, well speculated. Yeah, Hank Greenspun, who was the editor of the newspaper in Las Vegas, uh, I guess he um, he made that allegation that he was known to be gay. The day after the the article claiming that Joe McCarthy was gay was published, uh, Joe McCarthy made a big public display of marrying his secretary. Uh, <laughs> You know, and have, he announced have we all been the next, there. You know? <laughs> right. The next day he announced, Oh, I'm marrying my secretary. And they went and he's like, Look, I'm married, I have a wife, yeah. I'm clearly not gay. Um, you know, uh, he did that right afterwards. So that was very, very sketch and suspicious. And the other thing is that Roy Cohn, uh, who was was Joe McCarthy's very, very close uh, you know, close collaborator, and he was a prominent Republican up until the nineteen eighties. Roy Cohn was very well known to be gay and actually died of HIV. Yes. Um, you know, and was uh, seen sub- in subject of uh, An- Angels of America. The people are familiar with that that uh, media production. Indeed, and I, from what I understand, when when directly asked uh, if he was gay in a public forum, Roy Cohn would respond. He would say, "Well, I can't be gay because I'm very successful." Yes. Um, and the definition of a homosexual is one who is not successful in their career. And I'm highly successful, so I cannot be a homosexual. Um, that, that was that, and that's a very strange way of answering the that's, question. That's how we answer uh, quite, uh, accusations that Twink Revolution is successful. We say we can't be successful. We're homosexuals. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. Yeah. Um, so clearly for Kamala, for the like identitarian left, 
the main fixation is that she's like a woman and a feminist icon and like she's half Indian, half black. Um, and then that's very important as a candidate. Um, but you mentioned kind of how there's emerged this absence of class solidarity and economic notions of socialism, like central planning, which has resulted in a left largely based in victimology. Um, how do we like kind of get through that? And like, what are the obstacles for the few remaining like old school lefties? Because clearly that's always going to be a crux used against us because you're, you're silencing a black woman who wants to become the first VP or president. <laughs> Indeed. Well, what's what's very odd is that, you know, Kamala, you know, the amount of times in her speeches that she references her own childhood is not small. Yeah. Um, yeah which is very odd. And you, know, you remember that moment where, where she said to Joe Biden, you know, she talked about being one of the first, uh, you know, first students to integrate schools in Berkeley. And she says, that little girl was me. And then immediately her campaign started selling t-shirts with the face of 10 year old Kamala Harris on it. And 10 year old Kamala Harris's face is, is, is like an image for the campaign. Now, and, and what's interesting is to the folks that are very, very concerned about identity politics, that's a particularly important thing. Like I knew, uh, people of color who voted for Barack Obama simply because they wanted their children to grow up knowing that their child could become president or that they could become president, right? And that, it, that, that by having a, a black man as president, it gave a huge boost of self-esteem to every black child in the United States. And I mean, that's a legitimate argument. I'm not, yeah. you know, I'm, I mean, I, I voted for him because I thought he was a, a Kenyan secret Muslim socialist, but like, <laughs> whatever, you know, you could take yeah. what you can get. Right, right. And, you know, I mean, Kamala Harris, I mean, they really emphasized that at the Democratic National Convention in the video about her, like, you know, and, and they just showed, you know, young girls of color cheering, like one of us can be present. They really are emphasizing that. Um, it, it's very, very interesting. And when you talk about the victimology, the, the amount of the amount of times she references her own child, her, I mean, she's she's not young, you know, I mean, I mean, she's well over 50 years old. So the fact that, that, that her childhood comes into every speech is a very, very odd odd thing, but it points to kind of the victimology that we talk about, right? Where it's like, it seems like on the right, there is a lack of empathy, right? There's this, this kind of cruelty, you know, we, we, we don't feel sympathy for people. We admire rich and powerful. That's very dangerous. That's Ayn Rand. That's, that's pretty dark. But the problem is the left, I think, often goes too far in the opposite direction, where it's like, we want people to be victims. It's like, how big of a victim can we be, right? And it's, I mean, and what's missing, right, is the notion of a strong political leader, not as a victim, but as a, a powerful parent figure who can solve problems, right? I mean, that that is kind of, if you look at Roosevelt, if you look at Abraham Lincoln, uh, if you look at, at, you know, great historical figures, revolutionary leaders around the world, you can talk about Fidel Castro and others, that the role that they played, they didn't, they, they weren't looking like victims, right? And they, they weren't also looking like cruel people that are, are, are indifferent to the others. They're actually coming across as a, a kind of father of the country, a powerful figure who will make things right and protect the downtrodden, right? And that that is, you know, Freud talks about that being kind of a natural desire we all have. We all have a desire, and he talks about the notion of God even playing that role, right? God is, as we've all kind of invented this magical father in the sky who's going to make everything okay, that we all have a desire for that. And that in times where we have very strong, effective political leaders, they're filling that role, right? They're seen as powerful figures who will fight for the downtrodden and oppressed and make things right in the world, create justice with their strength. They're strong, but they're not oppressors. They're strong, but they're not brutal. And that's what's missing in leftist discourse. We celebrate victimhood. We rightly call out the right for their lack of empathy. But, but the idea of being strong and powerful, but moral and righteous is also kind of missing. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm, I'm trying to remember. It, I, I think you, you mentioned... Um shit sorry the quote's escaping me um uh there, there was a, a woman who sort of oversaw one of the five-year plans yes. um has a wonderful pithy quote about the role of stalin in, in that um construction of a uh sorry maybe maybe you can help fill, fill me in the details here <laughs> woman is tatiana fedorova um and she's interviewed in a pbs documentary called red flag 1917 um and it was just kind of a a, a, a really long pbs miniseries in the 90s going over the history of communism but they were forced to kind of, you know, get into why it was that the Soviet government was popular. So they interviewed some elderly folks. And then the full interview, the transcript of the full interview is available on PBS.org. 
And Tatiana Fedorova speaks in, in, in just glowing terms about Stalin. She helped build the railroads uh, uh, of the Moscow subways, right? I mean, she, she built the trains, right? Um, and she talks in great length about how Stalin, you know, it was like she says, Stalin set a task and we went out and did it, right? And that he was the idol, right? And, and she wasn't the only person to talk this way. All kinds of people were going to the Soviet Union during the 1930s and seeing the amazing achievements of the socialist economy. And, and marveling about it. You know, about H.G. Wells was a big admirer of what went on. Uh, uh, Sidney and Beatrice Webb, uh, you know, I mean, many different economists and academics. Albert Einstein went over there. What the Soviet Union did when they took a very, very poor, you know, backward country, mostly illiterate, mostly agrarian, and made it an industrial superpower in five years with the first five-year plan. I mean, it had the world's largest hydroelectrical power plant. I mean, it, it had wiped out illiteracy. It had some of the biggest universities. I mean, the, the amount of achievements that they carried out were massive. And, and that really was what made many people around the world join communist parties and have respect for it. And then the fact that then when the Nazis invaded, despite losing 26 million people in the war, they were able to defeat the Nazis and then rebuild to an even higher economic level than they had been in before that was unprecedented. I mean, that showed the strength of socialist central planning. Um, and, and that has to come across. When, when in, in the writing, I really had to, to get that across. And I quote many people talking about these achievements um, and talking about kind of the role that Stalin played and how he was able to kind of unleash the population to do these great things. And I compare it similar to what, you know, what was done by, by Roosevelt with his Works Progress Administration, what was done by Huey Long in Louisiana, right? That this kind of history of populism that isn't about fomenting racism or, or inciting people against each other, but rather about unleashing a spirit of selflessness and construction in order to build a better life for the country, uh, that that is very, very powerful. And that that used to be something that leftism was very much associated with. And if we're going to get out of the mess we're in right now politically, it's going to have to be revived. Good. Well, that's um, that's an appropriate amount of Stalin apologia for uh, for a Twink Revolution <laughs> episode. We have a we have a quota. Um, no, we, no, it is honestly. It's um. Uh, I mean, sorry. I, I will insert the first admonishment for everybody to pick up the book because, um, if if you would if you would like this history delivered, uh, I mean, very thoroughly researched and well argued, then you should definitely read it. But I want to change tacks a little bit. Um, and and just kind of back to the origins of the new left. Which you sort of obviously, I think, I think um, argue that Kamala is sort of a product of that that fertile ground, but um, you you talk about the connections between the Frankfurt School, which you know is 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 a uh, looms large in the public imagination on the left these days, and the new left. So I was kind of curious if you if you could tell us a little bit more about what you think, sort of you know the Frankfurt School. What is the you know what what, what was going on there? then and and what's the lasting impact now well the frankfurt school you have individuals like theodore adorno and herbert marcuse and others um and that that they were around they were maybe influenced by marxism before but after the second world war a lot of funding uh went to them to do research to get published in germany uh there was a magazine called dermonat um I believe that means the month, if I'm not mistaken. It sounds like a pharmaceutical product or something, you know, mm -hmm. rash cream or something. Yeah, well, it was, it was a magazine called Dermonat that was supposed to be a leftist progressive magazine. Uh, it was very, very, you know, very, it's well documented now. It was funded by the CIA. Um, and, uh, you know, in the United States, uh, there was partisan review. Um, in, uh, there was the Paris Review. Uh, and th th these magazines that paid certain intellectuals, large sums of money to, to write articles that were then widely circulated all over the university system. And it was well documented now the CIA was doing all of this. Um, and the Frankfurt School was very much a product of that. Um, now Adorno, uh, you know, he's very famous for his authoritarian personality study. Um, and what's interesting is that one of the people uh, who worked with him on the study, uh, one of the, the collaborators, one of the co-authors of the book, that came out uh, was none other than uh, the the an individual who was was employed by the Tavistock Institute in Britain. Um, now you know now there's a lot of things people say about the Tavistock Institute that are obviously crazy conspiracy theories. Sorry, okay? I'm not familiar with them at all. So if you could oh, okay, well, remedial <laughs> study. Oh, there. the Tavistock Institute for Social Research. Um, it was originally a British intelligence kind of uh, a research facility during the Second World War. It became private after the Second World War. They did a lot of research into like advertising 
what kind of things people want to buy, uh, what kind of music people want to listen to. Um, it's the Tavistock Institute for Social Research. It's in Britain. Now, there are some who go as far to make allegations that like Beatles music was all dreamed up in Tavistock as a way to brainwash the young. You know, I'm not going to go that far, okay? I mean, but it, it's a real institute for research that was really set up by British intelligence uh, that did all kinds of research in, into personality theory and advertising and all of that. And there, its ties to MI6 were, were pretty well established, right? Well, one of the you know collaborators with Adorno on his project was actually someone from the Tavistock Institute. So, I mean, it was very much, very much an intelligence, intelligence operation. What's particularly interesting is that a lot of things that in, in his personality study of the authoritarian personality would make you a fascist would also make you a communist, <laughs> right? Like his F scale, he calls it this, the scale he rates people's personalities on how fascist you are. Um, you know, do you have very clear beliefs? Uh, do you have a strong, uh, you know, do you not like ambiguity? Uh, do you like certain types of music? I mean, it's like the more you look into the study, the more it's very much, um, you know, if you're a person who is really passionate about things, believes in right and wrong, wants to go out and fight for a cause, you're potentially a fascist. Um, the original and, horseshoe theory uh, being enacted there. <laughs> yeah, basically. Um, and, and, but that's kind of the Frankfurt School view of things. And Susan Sontag, who comes out of the, the Partisan Review, which was also at the same time, she very famously said that communism was basically the most effective form of fascism. It was fascism with a human face, right? So, I mean, and that kind of thinking where leftism simply becomes about giving freedom to intellectuals and un giving intellectuals the freedom to, to unleash themselves and protecting intellectuals from the mob, right? That's what Ayn Rand, that's what, that's what all the voices of liberalism tend to view the masses of ordinary people as, as the mob. Right. These inferior rabble who if they get if they're not being properly managed, will get out of control and, and who knows what they'll do. Right. It, it, if that's what leftism is, is about protecting individuals from the mob. At that point, uh, is this really socialism? Is I mean, at this point, it's simply a form of um, of liberalism. Yep. Um, yeah. I mean, um, let me add that, uh, you know, Hannah Arendt is also somebody who was promoted by the CIA during that period. Um, and she wrote a book called Eichmann in Jerusalem, um, which was about, you know, the, the war criminal mass murderer Adolf Eichmann, uh, who was, you know, kidnapped from Argentina and executed in, in Israel. Um, and she sat in at his trial and she writes this book, uh, you know, about a study of the banality of evil. And, you know, the book is often quoted about the dangers of conformity. I remember when I first read it, I loved it because I thought, yeah, like, I'm not going to be a conformist. I'm going to be a free thinker because, you know, but the more you long, read long, book, long hair, Caleb era. <laughs> yeah, right. But if you look into the context of the book, the message of the book is that basically that Eichmann wasn't a supervillain. He was an ordinary person. Before he joined the Nazi party, he was part of the YMCA. Um, and that his arguments and his defense were very unoriginal. And that basically the message is deep down, ordinary people are Nazis. Um, ordinary people, average people deep down are Nazis. And if they get together and people are rallying them to fight for what they want, uh, that's scary. That's you're going to get another Nazi situation. Right. And that's kind of the message of the book. Now, you know, you know, the Nazis were awful and fascism is awful, but communism and fascism are not the same thing. Right. I mean, they're, they're, you know, progressive populism, organizing people for justice, building solidarity, you know, making a world where people have what they need to survive. Uh, that is a very different thing than than the menace and, and historical evil that you could call fascism. So so that's kind of missing fear of the people, fear of the masses. Anti-populism becomes a theme in leftism as as these powerful forces are kind of distorting leftism to fight communism, but also to try and wage this fight with another factional in class. Yeah, of the Hannah Arendt, how do you say your last name? <laughs> the Hannah uh, Arendt. Arendt. Arendt, okay. Yeah. You mentioned the idea that all working people are like potential Nazis, and it seems to really be growing as a conception, especially as like Trump emerged. I mean, there's the Hillary Clinton comment of deplorables or of COVID. You see people like basically saying it's good that people are dying in the South because the red states. Ha ha, COVID. your boat, your boat sank because it had a <laughs> Trump flag on it. I'm glad you're dead. Ha 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 ha. Yeah. Do you Ugh. like what, what made the left adopt these anti-worker things? I think we can kind of guess like the capitalist class might do it as a form of control, but it seems like it's growing in this like, broader the, like the, yeah, new these, left these, mil milieu. Right. I mean, the, these people are not, um, the, the people really doing this, are pushing this line they're they're not they're not factory owners they're they're 
kind of themselves not not particularly advantaged. It's pessimism. I mean, it's ultimately the belief that that we're not going to get to a better world. And that is pretty prevalent in leftist circles. The world is going to end because of global warming. We're all going to die. Uh, the economy is getting worse. We're all using too many resources. Uh, you know, the Malthusian thinking uh, has really, you know, eroded into left wing circles. Um, and the belief that that we really there is no future. Um, you know, I mean, Marxism is good for deconstruction in some ways, right? Because, I mean, it, it, it's good, right? I mean, I, I've talked before about like, you know, but, you know, before Marxism came along, people had the, this idea that, that you know, the, the nuclear family, what we call the nuclear family was somehow sacred. Well, it's not, right? For most of human history, it didn't exist, right? And then you had, you know, a man and how many wives, right? And now we have, you know, monogamy and now we have gay marriage, right? And that the family relations are always changing as the economic base is changing. Things Marxism, do get worse, we, we agree. <laughs> Marxism is is showing that, right? I mean, that's that's Marxism is very good for that. Marxism shows that capitalism is not the eternal system, right? That you know, there's been hunter gatherer civilization, feudalism, up into capitalism, right? So, so Marxism is good at deconstructing kind of the myths that hold society together at one time, but it deconstructs them to replace it with its own mission, which is history's challenge, right? That, that the working class must become aware of its historical duty to lead humanity in the march toward a stateless, classless world with vast material abundance, that, 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 that the, the, the myths of the present are deconstructed, but then replaced with the history's challenge, with the ideology of Marxism. But uh, the postmodern crowd, they take the deconstruction of Marx. They love the deconstruction part. But they also uh, denounce the, the, the good part, the optimism of Marxism. They say, well, that's just a myth also. And everything becomes a big fat lie. Everything is phony. There is no truth. Everything's a matter of opinion. The world is getting worse, not better. Uh, everyone is deceptive. You're lying to yourself. Um, you know, and and human humanity. There is there really any hope in humanity? Are humans really any better than any better than animals? And you know, I mean, who's to say that uh, that hunter gatherer civilization is not as good as what we have now? I mean, who's to say that? Right? Everything's relative. And and what's the what's the point of the future? I mean, this kind of dark dark pessimism. Morality is deconstructed. Truth is deconstructed. Everything just kind of leads to this very very dark sad existential place. And we get that, you get that from, from all the big philosophers that are associated with this new left that is a break from Marxism. Um, I mean, talk about Derrida. Uh, you can talk about, um, uh, for example, Michel Foucault. Uh, I mean, and this is, this is where this kind of thinking leads to. And that place, yeah, it is very much, you know, it's, it's, yeah, okay. He died. He's a Trump supporter. Screw him. You know, Oh, F this country. I hope it all burns down, you know, woo, destruction, go out and break shit. There is no hope. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's kind of where it leads to. It leads to a level of hopelessness. I mean, you talk about depression, right? I mean, depression is rising. The suicide rate in the United States is very high right now. Um, and it's like, well, I mean, the philosophy that is being espoused largely uh, by our society is a, a very depressing, pessimistic philosophy. Meanwhile, the myths that people used to believe to, to get through life, like evangelical Christianity, like, you know, patriotism and all that, are being deconstructed, right? I mean, and it's true. I mean, the United States has a bloody history of imperialism and colonialism and Vietnam and Korea, and that's true, and it needs to be deconstructed, right? I mean, you know, the, 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 the bigotry and ignorance of creationism and such need to be deconstructed. These lies need to be deconstructed. But if you don't replace them with anything, you just replace them with this angst, this kind of, and the only virtue is destruction, is tearing things down. You're going to lead to a big, big problem pretty soon because people, people are by nature progressive. People move through life. Every year in my life, I've gotten older than I was the year before. Can you believe it? Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, it's it's it, it's like human beings seek to create. They seek to build. They seek to get things done. They seek to accomplish things. So if you tell them there is no point in doing that, uh, you're going to lead people to a psychological crisis. Well, that's, uh, I mean, uh, I love that you touched on that. I mean, um, the, I feel like one of, one of the comforts in my life has been the kind of belief that there's, there's a material basis to the idea that this capitalist system that, that immiserates us all and immiserates so many um, it, it, you know, will, must lead to something else. And that we, we, you know, it is our, it is our job to kind of 
try and shape what it turns into, but but it but it will progress beyond this. I feel like we're um, kind of touching tangentially on your last book. I don't know if it's quite your last last book, but but another book you wrote, um, Vandals and City Builders. Would yeah. you would you want to give us a a, a a brief summary on what you know the cause for optimism in that? Well, that book uh, largely argues that there are two trends in human history, the city building tendency and the vandal tendency. Um, And it goes through human history from the time of, you know, undergatherer civilization up until now talking about these two tendencies and how they manifest themselves. And uh, I talk about the history of the 20th century, the crisis of Marxism at the beginning, the rise of the Soviet Union. I talk about the distortion of leftist politics. I and it, it's, it opens with kind of a lengthy essay making this point. And then I, I use, I, I, I you know, I, I feature a number of essays I've written, you know, along these themes about divisions in the ruling class, about geopolitics. Um, and I think it's, I think it's, you know, it's, it's a good piece I put out. It's sold quite a few copies. I mean, hundreds of copies of it have sold and many people around the world have, have given me very good reviews of it. Um, it's currently in the process of being translated into three different languages. Uh, and, uh, you know, I mean, every time there's a friend of mine who goes to Venezuela, every time he goes, he brings a big stack of them. You know, uh, people are reading it in Iran. People are reading it in Russia. I mean, it's, it's had an impact. Uh, I, there are a number of Chinese folks who have also read it, and there's talk of a Chinese translation as well. Um, it made a big ripple uh, for, for a book uh, that I put out. I put it out with a friend of mine who has a small publishing house and we put it out and it's gotten a very, very good circulation. Um, and, uh, a number of people have approached me and said, this really changed their outlook. I mean, they, and the thing is, I don't know about you all. I don't know you all's, you know, origin story, so to speak, but you know, with me, I discovered Marxism on my own. I'm from a very small town. I got interested in Marxism because I liked the message, the optimism, right? Yeah. The, the hope for a new world and the history. And I've discovered Marxism on my own. I then went and found the Marxist movement. And it's almost like at that point, it's like, okay, take what you can, right? Bit of, because, a bit of a letdown, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> right. That's the experience that almost every young Marxist has, right? Uh, whereas we discover Marxism on our own by reading history, but eventually, but then we go and find the Marxist movement and we find something that is in complete shambles, right? I, I call it the wreckage of the common turn. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, that's really what, what's there, right? It's the, it's the, the wreckage of the common turn. Um, and so what's going on? Why is this happening? And what can we do to get a Marxism back, uh, that, that could be the, you know, I mean, the great mass movement that gave inspiration to Nelson Mandela and Albert Einstein and so many great heroic revolutionaries throughout history. How can we get that Marxism back? Uh, what do we have to do? Um, and I think that my book, City Builders and Vandals is an attempt to get into that. And it's, that's a theme that goes through all of my work. And in the Kamala book, it comes across. The Kamala book is a, a short essay in three parts to try and analyze this figure, Kamala Harris, to, to present the audience with information they do not have about not only Kamala Harris, but the, the world that created her and where we're going as a country. Yeah, so we're coming up on time. Um, I, I first will give my own plug and then turn the floor to you, Caleb, to uh, to let people know where they can get the book. Um, but uh, people who are not familiar with Caleb's work, um, he's an incredibly prolific uh, YouTuber. Um, one of the most prolific I know. And uh, <laughs> um, um, I struggle to keep up with your output, Caleb. But uh, I've got to say, um, what is there has, you know, it's it's optimistic. It's historically grounded. Um, and, and you, you will find a, a community and an audience of people who are, um, interested in building a, a, a kind of, a, you know, a vision of, of a socialist future that is, um, one I would like to participate in. So, um, definitely check out Caleb Maupin on YouTube. We'll have that linked in the episode description, but, um, the book about Kamala, where do people find it, Caleb? Amazon.com. That's where you can get it. Fantastic. Uh, um, yeah. yeah, so Kamala Harris and the Future of America. Um, my paper copy, I believe, is a day or two away. Um, it's uh, yeah, it's it's a very reasonably priced as well, honestly, for a yes. for a, a substantial work. Yeah, well, it's not that long. I mean, it's 133 pages, so no, it's you a know, quick read. Yeah, I'm and, gonna say uh, yeah. Sam Sam got through it in a day. I uh, it took took me a little longer because I was a bit distracted, but. Uh, that was the intent. I wanted to write something that people could read in, in one day. You know, it's weird. You know, I'm, I'm a nerdy guy. You know, sometimes I do my, my, uh, my YouTubes in front of this huge bookshelf that I have. Um, but I forget, you know, I wrote City Builders and Vandals, which is over 500 pages. Um, and I gave it to a number of people and uh, none of them read it. Um, and I realized <laughs> it was too big. Um, you, you know, and, and so I realized that, you know, sometimes a short book, people will feel more like they can just, you know, devour it. You know what yep. I'm saying? 
Um, for me, I mean, I grew up in a library. My mom's a librarian. You know, you just walk in and it's like, I, you know, you get from the book what you want, right? If it's boring you, you skip this part, you skip that part. But a lot of people see books almost like they're like watching a movie or something. Like they want to, they don't want to miss any scene. So, so sometimes giving somebody a 500 page book can be almost intimidating to them. We, we're, we live in a very non-literate society. People know how to read, but they don't like to. You know what I mean? It, 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 it kind of intimidates them. It makes them a little bit nervous, I've realized. Um, especially now with so much media that is not written. You know what I mean? People, people don't take pleasure in reading. Um, you know, so I, I, I feel like a shorter book uh, is, is a way to reach people with, with the same ideas. And that, um, you know, and there's a tradition of that too. I mean, for every big, huge book by Lenin, there's a very short essay making the same points. I mean, not many people don't realize that. <laughs> yep. Imperialism, The Highest Stage of Capitalism by Lenin is an amazing book, but it's very long, right? But there is a book that is, there's a, an 11 page essay called Imperialism and the Split in Socialism that makes all the same points just very quickly. He doesn't go into the meticulous documentation of everything he's saying. He just kind of says, this is what I think imperialism is. Here's what I, here's how it's dividing the socialist movement, et cetera. And it's, it's, it's much, it's much more concise. And that's important. I think you have to do both, right? I think for what is to be done, one of Lenin's most important books, there's a very short essay called Where to Begin. Yep. Um, and that, that, that it, it's good to have a, a concise Reader's Digest condensed form and to also have your, your big, rich, well-researched, careful, giving an example of everything you say as well, right? I think it's, they're both important to do. Um, but I want to say what you guys are doing here on Twink Rev is also very amazing, oh, right? Um, thank you, Caleb. You guys are, are not afraid to be controversial, um, <laughs> not afraid to... Accidentally, uh, uh, sometimes. Yeah, not afraid to ruffle some feathers and ask questions that need to be asked. And uh, it's very bold and very exciting. And I, I, I want to encourage both of you. Uh, you just started. How long ago has it been? I mean, it's, it's been not a that year. Long um, we're we're going to after after we finished recording, we're going to we're going to make you uh, publish a one year plug for our, for our <laughs> uh, anniversary episode. But uh, okay. we'll do. We'll yeah. do. Um, so the book is Kamala Harris and the Future of America, an essay in three parts. It's available on Amazon.com uh, for a very reasonable price. Got to say. Um, and Caleb is on YouTube at Caleb Maupin. And then you're also on Patreon. Uh, I assume it's patreon.com slash Caleb Maupin, I believe. Yeah, yep. Me. We'll have that link in the episode description. Honestly, yeah. Check out what Caleb's up to. Um, he is, he is one of the, uh, one of the people who will never bullshit you. will never lie to you. And that's, you know, that's a valuable thing these days. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Caleb, thank you for being here. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> 